Hello and welcome back to the Chronicles of Aguna, the Arsenal podcast brought to you by the last man standing with loserpool.com. As ever, I'm your host, Harry Simeon. And on today's edition, we're going to be talking about a variety of subjects. We're going to be talking about England, Bulgaria. We're going to be talking about Gareth Southgate. It is the international break after all. We're going to be talking about the changes at Watford ahead of our visit there next Sunday. Uh, we're going to be talking about Matteo Genduzzi. Uh, a very interesting article on Granite Xhaka, which I'll be pointing you in the direction of. Uh, talking Danny Ceballos, Eddie Nketiah and Rob Holding. So I'm going to start off uh, with England versus Bulgaria. Now we know that the international break is... Um, how can I put it? It's boring, isn't it? I think most football fans will agree. Most Premier League fans will agree. I think that we've come to the stage where our domestic competition is so competitive. It's played to such a high standard that international football has lost its appeal. And that's for a number of reasons. And I think part of the reason is because we see teams like England going up against you know weak opposition. And that's no disrespect to Bulgaria because they're not the only ones. Uh, but it isn't a real measure of where England are as a team when you see them sort of roll over uh, these so-called uh, smaller nations, weaker nations, whatever you want to call them. Um, but I think you know the UEFA Nations League breathed a bit of life into that. But overall, in terms of these qualification uh, campaigns, I find them boring. Let me know what you think. I saw the England game. Um, and I think that it's very difficult, isn't it, to make any conclusions about where this England team are at um, because the opponents that they're coming up against are so weak and that has to be taken into consideration. And for me, that makes it really, really difficult. But, you know, people have been talking about Gareth Southgate, you know, lots of uh, you have been tweeting and stuff. And I was reading through, actually, a lot of you questioning his team selections, his tactics, his approach, etc. And many people questioning whether Gareth Southgate is the man to take England into Euro 2020. Now, my take on it is that given what Gareth Southgate achieved uh, at the last tournament uh, and the progress of some of those young players that he's seen, uh, you know, come through, I think he's got to be given uh, at least another tournament. And I think that England will be uh, you know, more well-equipped in that tournament. Although I thought in the World Cup, they exceeded everybody's expectations by getting to the last four. Remarkable achievement. I think the run they had was a little bit fortuitous and there was lots of other factors, you know, like the draw, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, you know, credit where it's due, England went to the World Cup semi-finals, And I think for that reason... And that reason alone, Gareth Southgate deserves uh, another crack at a tournament, in my personal opinion. Let me know what you guys think. Of course, you can tweet us uh, at uh, Chronicles underscore AFC and let me know what you think on that particular matter. Now, let's move on to Watford. Now, Watford, of course, are our next Premier League opponents. The Gunners travel there next Sunday. Um, and Watford announced yesterday that they had parted company with manager Javi Grazia. Now, Javi Grazia, you know, he, he took Watford on an interesting FA Cup run last season, a very positive FA Cup run. But the fact is that the league form in the last 15 games has not been good enough. I read somewhere yesterday that they've only beaten Fulham and Huddersfield since March. Now, that is not acceptable. Two teams that went down, two teams that were extremely poor last season. So, you know, People who say that this Javi Grazia sacking has come completely out of the blue, you're wrong. This has been going on for a little bit of time now. The Pozzos are renowned for doing that. They they usually pull the trigger when they feel you know, that the manager's gone as far as he can. And I wasn't really surprised to see Grazia gone. A lot of you were. I wasn't shocked. But I was shocked to hear that they've reappointed Kike Sanchez Flores. Now, Flores was a manager who I thought did really well in his first spell at Watford and was probably unfortunate to lose his job. But he's back now. So will Watford have that new manager bounce going into next Sunday's game? And is that something that Unai Emery and Arsenal should be wary of? I hope to bring you more insight into that throughout the week uh, as we build up towards the Watford game. Uh, we'll be getting one of our pals from uh, one of the Watford podcasts to come and join me. Uh, and hopefully he'll be able to provide uh, some further insight on that as I said but let me know what you think Kike Sanchez Flores positive for Watford and I know that I'm drifting away from Arsenal here we've spoken about England we're speaking a little bit about Watford now our next opponents but it is the international break so give me a break guys come on uh, but yeah that's um, 
uh, that's my my take on the Watford thing. I think the Grazia sacking was coming. It was, uh, you know, a, a build up over a long period of time, and the start to the season certainly hasn't helped him. I was surprised that they didn't give him more than four games this season, but uh, given their their poor form at the back end of last season, it's understandable. Uh, and the Pozzos, much like Roman Abramovich, I know not to the same extent because Chelsea have gone on and won things, but the Pozzos do make changes and the Pozzos do get results. If you look at where Watford were and where they are now, it's very hard to argue with their approach, in my opinion anyway. But of course, let us know what you think in the comments section below. Matteo Genduzzi, who of course impressed in the second half in particular of the North London derby, had his first call-up for the French senior side. Matteo Genduzzi, part of the team uh, that overcame Albania in Paris. A little bit of a mix-up there where the uh, stadium played the wrong national anthem. That was embarrassing. No question about that. Matteo Genduzzi, of course, was an unused substitute, but the experience uh, and you know, of being part of Le Bleu will be a huge, huge bonus to a very young, talented player and a player who uh, we hope to see develop and go on to huge things at Arsenal Football Club. But I just wanted to, to highlight that because I've been critical of Matteo Genduzzi in the past, not because I don't like him or I don't want him to succeed, but I just wanted to, you know, highlight that I do recognize that achievement and for him that is huge he's, uh, he's spoken about how he found out about the call-up it's a great story for a young kid and uh, you know he may not have featured last night uh, for France but just being in that squad and being in that dressing room and having that French shirt with his name on it will be a huge huge boost to the youngster and fingers crossed when he returns to the Arsenal we'll see more uh, positive performances from him. Uh, now I want to point you guys in the direction of a very very interesting article written uh, by James Benj um, a fantastic football writer and somebody that I class as a friend um, I will leave the link in the description. James Benj talks about what Granite Xhaka brings to the side then he speaks about the passing, he speaks about the fact that in actual fact Granit Xhaka recovered possession more times than Lucas Torreira did last season. And there's some really, really interesting key stats and facts in there that perhaps highlight what it is that Emery and Wenger before him saw in Granit Xhaka that maybe us as supporters at times we overlook. So uh, I'm not going to read through the article on here and I'm not going to pull out all the stats and facts for you here, but the uh, link is in the description. So please do check it out. And I'm sure you'll be very interested to read uh, some of what you're going to discover in that piece. So a big uh, shout out to James Benj for that one. Now, some news has emerged that Danny Ceballos, pleaded with Real Madrid not to sell him when they were in negotiations with Arsenal over the move. It's understood that Danny Ceballos uh, insisted that there was no option to buy uh, in that contract and that Arsenal uh, you know, would have to give him back to Real Madrid at the end of the season. And it's understandable. I've seen a few Arsenal fans criticising him, saying, oh, well, why is he here then if he only wants to play for Real Madrid? You've got to understand that growing up as a young Spanish lad, Real Madrid is the pinnacle of football. In many people's eyes, they are the biggest club in world football. And you can totally understand why somebody like Danny Ceballos doesn't want to give up on his Real Madrid career just yet. That doesn't mean that he can't be a good servant to Arsenal. That doesn't mean that we can't get the maximum out of him during his time here and that he can't help us achieve our goals. So I just urge some of those supporters who have been critical of him to get behind him because right now Danny Ceballos is wearing an Arsenal shirt, not a Real Madrid one. For me, it's a non-issue. Completely understand where the lad's coming from. Uh, and I think most young Spanish kids would probably feel the same way. Eddie Nketiah has spoken about the fact he was in Unai Emery's plans this season. Uh, and the confidence boost that that gave him was huge. But Eddie Nketiah decided that heading off to Leeds was still the right thing to do. And I agree. A striker needs to play games. A striker needs to be scoring goals. Scoring goals, as I've said many times in the past, is a habit. And if he can do that and forge that habit at Leeds, then he'll come back a much better player for it. Eddie Nketiah also revealed that there were offers from Germany too, but he and his family felt that Leeds was the best place to go. And uh, again, I understand stylistically the championship, um, you know, is closer to the Premier League than perhaps some of the foreign uh, leagues. And just finally, to round up uh, today's short episode, Arsenal have supposedly received a fitness boost. It's understood that Rob Holding 
told a fan in Luton Airport that he is ready to play after the international break. Now, it remains to be seen whether that's actually true or not. But just the fact that Rob Holding is talking about coming back into the team is a massive boost for Arsenal. But what I want to know from you guys is when Rob Holding does return, assuming he comes back into the starting lineup, who would you drop? Would you partner him with Socrates, partner him with Lewis, go to a back three? Or would you maybe push David Lewis into that defensive midfield position? Let me know what you think in the comments section below. That brings us to the end of another episode brought to you by our sponsors, Loserpool. I'm uh, going to leave you with a quick uh, ad from Loserpool at the end of this episode. Don't forget to subscribe, like, share. You know the drill by now. Um, big thanks to those listening on the audio. If you are on iTunes, please subscribe and leave us a review too. It is much, much appreciated. And we'll be back tomorrow with some more Arsenal content. Until then, take care. <laughs>